My name is John McConnell of Cliff Family Winery. I'm the executive chef. And John, tell us about your operation. What's unique about it? So we actually uh, service St. Helena uh, by means of our tasting room with a food truck. And we happen to be parked right next to our tasting room. So though disconnected by two operations, essentially we function as a full-service restaurant with a little bit more hospitality. And tell us what's unique about the food truck because you get your food from an organic farm. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, most of our food uh, is basically, or at least the menu is dictated by what's offered from our uh, organic certified farm, which happens to be dislocated right up on Howe Mountain, just overlooking Pope Valley, um, most of which we actually uh, procure and grow months in advance. So uh, what the dilemma we're faced with is we're writing our, month, our menu nine months in advance uh, to basically kind of procure for what to expect in a given season. Uh, you have a lot of se uh, seasonal availability, which might change week to week or even month to month, uh, but that really kind of lends itself to what we offer and what's extended to us from the farm. Um, in addition to that, we also have a fruit orchard. Uh, we have bees that lay or make honey for us and then hens that lay eggs as well. Very cool. All right, so John, how would you describe your food philosophy? Uh, I would say at the end of the day, uh, granted we are a bruschetteria, so there's a lot of Italian influence. Um, and obviously because of our farm, there's a farm to table influence, as cliche as that is. Um, it's very playful. Uh, my goal at the end of the day is to make food that's ultimately delicious, uh, but very familiar as well and comforting. Great. And tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started in food? <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, my father was an engineer, a manufacturing engineer, so we changed uh, relocated states several times. Uh, so I really can't claim a state as to where I'm, I'm from, uh, but basically grew up in the Midwest. Uh, that being said, uh, food wasn't really a, a culture that existed where it was either appreciated or respected. Um, so initially I graduated high school excelling in math and science and went on to Iowa State University for a chemical engineer, engineering degree uh, that I would not graduate from. However, I would uh, withdraw myself and, and continue to do what I did at the time as a trade occupation was just cooking. So at the age of 17, I got involved at working in a restaurant. Uh, it was a chain restaurant called Chi Chi's, uh, where I worked as just a simple fry cook. Um, fascinated by the culture, uh, definitely uh, not a laden career path for me at the time, but definitely intrigued by what uh, respectable uh, characteristics the job demanded. And for me, uh, kind of uh, flourishing in ath athletics in high school, playing basketball, baseball, and football, I was really excited about the uh, rush and the adrenaline that was associated in the kitchen, very competitive as well. Um, so it was something I really kind of took pride in, but didn't necessarily understand it to be a career path. Uh, when I withdrew from college, I actually continued to cook uh, as we continued to relocate. And the only comfort for me in occupation was to continue to work in restaurants. Um, at some point in time, I was recruited, which was the, I guess, the gateway for me to explore this as a potential opportunity for a career. Um, by another chef who was actually working in an all-suite hotel. And I went in for an interview. One of the questions that boggled my mind, even to this day, it's very humbling, was the chef asked me, or asked me if I knew how to create or make what was my own recipe to make mayonnaise. And I thought it was a trick question. Uh, you mean like Hellman's that comes in a jar? Uh, so that being said, he was uh, very uh, understanding and willing to work with me and take me under his wing. So Ollie Barker, who is actually a former graduate of the CIA uh, Hyde Park, uh, was able to take me under his wing, and he was my what I would consider my true mentor. Uh, so he basically took me on almost as an apprentice. I would then basically become his sous chef uh, shortly thereafter and knew that I longed for education. So I was to seek out higher education, and here I am today. So and you worked for a while for Hirosone. What did you learn from Hirosone in that experience? Uh, interestingly enough, I went to a school that was in the East Coast, uh, New England Culinary Institute, not obviously a, a CIA uh, campus, uh, but it was really excited about the dynamic of understanding what the food and wine interaction was with a meal. Um, if I were to credit myself to be a fine dining chef, then certainly I should uh, at least educate myself on the aspects of food and wine and, and the interaction, respectively. Um, wanting ambitiously to go abroad, not understanding that I'd be able to afford to do so, my next best uh, move was to come to California, which at the time I felt was the pinnacle of uh, quality wine that was being made in the United States. And knowing that the reference point for me was Napa Valley, um, looked at a number of restaurants. I was truly fascinated about Hiro Sone. It was a husband and wife team, only open for dinner. Um, so it was a very kind of uh, humble cause of which they approached their business structure. It wasn't multi-units or lunch and dinner or breakfast. It was just exclusively for dinner. Uh, so truly excited about the small, unique business that they offered, but as a husband and wife team. I uh, would understand later that I met my uh, not wife at the time, but in culinary school. This is something that was an ambitious goal of ourselves to actually have our business of our own. So using them as kind of a, a guide 
to kind of explore what that could potentially be, I was excited to come out and work for them. The thing I was truly, really excited about working with Hiro as opposed to other chefs is that born in Japan, he represents uh, what I would consider uh, true wine cuisine, uh, which is very Californian inspired, uh, very seasonal influenced, but also uh, his regional aspects of his love and affair with northern Italian cuisine. Um, but also being classically trained in French technique. So for me, it was a, a win-win on several occasions. So I'm basically learning uh, the concepts and the techniques of three different cultures and cuisines, but just under one roof. So that's why I was really excited to kind of gain as much knowledge from him as possible. And what's been one of your big takeaways from that experience? Uh, for me, I was never given the opportunity, though I was technically a sous chef for Ali Barker when I was in Michigan, uh, didn't really have any managerial training. So when you set goals for yourself, and I was able to set a goal for myself after externship um, at Terra to become a sous chef. When that took place, you have to kind of reassess and reevaluate, well, what's the next goal? So for me, it was actually to become a chef de cuisine. Um, in that process, you have to learn uh, about management, and it's not necessarily a class or elective that's offered. It's something you learn on the way. And understanding how they ran and operate their business, um, it's been very tried and true 25 plus years later. And they've remained a standalone restaurant in Napa Valley with little to no promotion. In fact, even to this day, there's no signage out of the restaurant. Uh, for them to be able to do that based on word of mouth and quality um, and even still retain their Michelin star was always something that I was a big takeaway for me. Uh, it's a, the culture that exists in the restaurant, not necessarily just the acclaim. But for me, it was to know that if you invested so much of yourself into something because you believed in it or because you were talented, anything is possible. So looking back on your career, what advice would you give culinary students who are trying to navigate future careers? I think the thing that continues to come up with me when I have these uh, conversations or when those questions are asked is I would recommend for all students uh, to not be afraid of failure. I think um, it initially we choose this profession because we feel it's the right decision, uh, but it, you're faced always with the consequence and the toughness of is this the right profession? You're going to constantly be challenged in every aspect of this position. It's overcoming those challenges what makes it truly rewarding, but at the same time, you're always going to be faced with some type of defeat or even a failure. Uh, so to kind of learn from those uh, instances, get back on your feet and continue to look forward. Um, I feel like in this particular uh, profession, uh, not a lot is set up for success, uh, especially as trends come through, a concept of a restaurant, how you know successful a chef could be whatever press or, uh, you know, in the spotlight, it might be temporarily before those flames extinguish. How do you continue to reinvent, your, reinvent yourself? So it really causes you to be completely aware, but at the same time, always kind of reinventing yourself and staying with the times. So it, it really is uh, not at the end of the day, just about exclusively cooking, but really just kind of remaining to be uh, triumphant and willing to kind of accept failure for when it's present. So don't be afraid to fail. That's great. <laughs> Perseverance, endurance, yes. Well, what qualities have helped you succeed? I feel like just uh, for myself in particular, qualities that's helped me succeed is to continue to uh, reassess, you know, reflect, track how far you've come, where you're, you know, always have a, a, an end destination in mind. So for me, starting a new profession, a new job, uh, whatever that case may be, you, you ultimately assess what can you gain of that exposure or that environment. Um, what do you foresee, you know, your ultimate goals being in that scenario before you feel like you've either A, plateaued, or it's time to move on. So constantly having self-awareness as to what your goals are, uh, whether short-term or long-term, and continuing just to reach for the sky. Uh, that, that, to me, has always been um, the motivation of kind of pursuing what I feel is the right thing to do, which can be interpreted as success. Uh, as of lately, just being affiliated with the Cliff Family Winery in particular, taking something that was a no novel concept and actually have it be returned and rewarded and received well uh, from our local community to uh, tourists alike has been uh, kind of contagious to be a part of that success. And you can only help but to you know, feel a pr you know, proud of those moments. Uh, but to just to continue to understand where, you would like to where would you like to go? Where's your final destination? So looking back at your career, what were some of the smarter decisions you made? That's a tough question. Uh, Smarter decisions uh, were, uh, this is advice that was given to me when I was in school. Um, certainly did not understand this when I was younger as an adolescent, uh, but you know, failure to not work for the best. You know, put yourself in a place that's gonna challenge you. Um, this is important advice I'd definitely give to students as well, or even young professionals. Put yourself in a position where you're continued to be challenged 
uh, and you are surrounding yourself by the best talent out there. So work for the best, strive to be the best, just to only continue to give yourself the amount of resources that you need to be successful in any outlet. So which person has had the biggest influence on your career, and what did you take from that person? That's, a, that's another good one, too. Um, I think this is an easy one for me to answer, but it's a difficult question to answer, I guess, with detail. Uh, the person who has always been in my corner, and, and because a lot of it is basically kind of stemmed after or post-graduation, it would be my wife. Uh, she's uh, definitely been my supporter since day one and has constantly been in my camp and my corner just to continue to you know, reward me and uh, say, you know, job well done and kind of continue to validate those merits, too. So. She's definitely been a champion to every effort, and whether through the good and the bad, um, knowing that I'm critical of myself, she's always been in there. So, what are the biggest mistakes a young cook can make in any new job? Any don'ts that come to mind? Oh man, I think, and this kind of goes back to the uh, advice that I would give to fellow students. Um, I would recommend to not be afraid of failure. You know, understand that you will make mistakes. It's how you learn from those mistakes to kind of rebound, get back on your feet, and continue to look forward. Um, also, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. I feel like we live in a, a modern day society now where everything is accessible by Google, but you should still be asking pertinent questions, and that's how you learn. Uh, the the questions that don't get asked are the ones that will always be uh, the most difficult uh, to accept, especially when it's an exchange of knowledge. You know. Everybody is uh, in a position to learn, so you should therefore be asking the questions to con continue that education. Uh, so to me, as a, as a chef who welcomes externs and uh, staff alike, it is my duty and obligation to really have that be an exchange where there is knowledge being shared and passed. Uh, and this, you know, a good saying or a quote that I would attribute to that is, a uh, great teacher makes himself less necessary on a daily basis. So I look at that as a, as a challenge and an obstacle to continue to share what I know to the people around me or to the people who care to be with us. So, so uh, how do you keep growing professionally? What do you do to keep yourself learning and challenged and bettering yourself each year? I think it is my, uh, to answer that perfectly, how I continue to keep challenging myself or stay fresh is to continually just to be playful. Um, I am motivated uh, first and foremost by creativity. I happen to think with the right side of the brain. I'm very focused with science and mathematics, so there's a logical approach to understanding what I do. But the playful uh, crea uh, creations really what stimulates the day-to-day. -day. Um, and whether those moments are captured in the morning when I'm taking a shower, uh, to the drive home in the evening, uh, they can come in many forms, but it really kind of being aware of that outside-the-box mentality, that willing to kind of say, this is the traditional way of doing something, but I'm going to do this today because I feel like it's, it's possible. Anything's possible. But kind of approaching it with a, a, a sense of creativity really motivates me. And where do you think you get your inspiration from? I would say nowadays, the inspiration for me mainly comes from, uh, mainly, I'm a, I'm a visual cue kind of guy. Uh, the social media plays a huge impression in today's society, especially how chefs uh, receive and witness and observe one another. Uh, for that to be a reference point for us to even see something, whether we understand how it's made or the techniques are behind it, really kind of motivates us to think outside the box to say, this is either beautiful or that really kind of stimulates some reaction to say, that's a good, that's a good concept or I could do that or, you know, that's, you know, if at, the, at the end of the day, it's those visual cues that kind of keep me motivated to try or wanting to do something more than in, in, in addition to what we currently do, so. So take me through the creative process for a new menu item on the food truck in brief. You know. <laughs> but but where, how does that start, where does it go, and how does it end up on the menu? Oh, man. Uh, menu development for us, honest, honestly, it comes by way of abundance from the farm. You're, when you're stuck with you know, pounds and pounds of eggplant, when at, you've had your fair share of eggplant for the this, this season, you start to ultimately adopt a different process of how am I going to capture this eggplant utilize this eggplant so it doesn't go to the compost bin and actually make something truly delicious. So you really start to explore every outlet, every avenue of creativity, technique. You start finding, oh, oh this is what this chef's doing. Maybe we should, you know, there's some application there. But really most of the menu development is born by way of application, finding an outlet, abundance. I have this great product, where is it going to go? Um, instead of it being the opposite where you have a lab saying, I want to create this dish, most of those dishes are created by necessity because they have to be made into something other than you know, finding its way into the compost bin. 
So in the world of cooking right now, what has you really excited? <sighs> I, at the end of the day, um, I, I suspect that, and I was just having a conversation just about this, but it's at forefront, or forefront in my mind is what we can continue to do to close the, the gap, close the circle of what we grow ourselves, And really that helps dictate my thought process in most cases where it's not influenced by as much of outside resources or a trendy ingredient, for, for example. Uh, when you actually work with a farm and you're basically in tune to the, the seasons and the seasonality of things, what does well, what doesn't, uh, we've had a fair share of mistakes of learning the hard way that we can't just do everything, uh, but really understanding what we do well and sticking to it and really getting excited about what other facets, what other outlets can we provide for this particular ingredient to really showcase that uh, veg-centric approach of kind of working with a farm. Um, to also showcase ingredients like these beautiful eggs in a given season uh, or even working with honey in the winter time where it's much more viscous and you know distinctly different from the summer honey which is more light this is much more amber hued there's different aspects of the farm in a given year that really kind of gets me excited and it's a continual process it's usually week to week sometimes it could be as late as month to month and the slower seasons uh, but really that kind of gets me uh, really geeked about you know what's what's to come um, what you know motivates the next move or the philosophy or what changes a lot of it's basically just derived from just being in tune to what's happening at the farm and every season is another shot to get to do it again so what's different about cooking on a truck what, what are, what's the challenge what's the secret to cooking on a truck secret i don't know if i can give you the the, the secret uh, i don't know if that really exists for me if in, in if somebody were to ask me this you know you have one truck it's it's you know it seems to be very successful you guys have a good crowd a good following would you do a second truck would you do it again to be honest i'd probably say no uh, for us the toughest challenge that was unforeseen is that we open two kitchens a day and we close two kitchens a day so uh, if you're an hourly staff who's employed and works on our food truck you're doing 25 percent of your day goes into sanitation so it's not that that's the unglorious aspect of cooking that's the stuff that people don't really get excited about it might be touched on while you're in a culinary program uh, or even perhaps you started as a porter or even a dishwasher to become a chef one day. Uh, but this is something that's the unglorious aspect of what we do. But uh, in that regard, you know, uh, having a food truck, for example, um, seeing it through, for me, it was the, the, the ability to create your kitchen, which is a very, a very new experience for myself. Most restaurants, you accept as they are. If you're a chef, you're coming into a restaurant, right? Rarely do, does a chef have to build or construct a kitchen from ground zero and becomes his, and that's his domain for a number of years. In most cases, if you step into a chef role as a sous chef, a chef de cuisine, executive chef, those kitchens are already established and they're founded. Um, so for you to walk into that environment, you're working with what you already have around you. So for us to be able to design the food truck and the kitchen, the layout outright, really gave me the flexibility to do anything, really. And we've had a great number of successes doing pop-up dinners as of late, which really aren't you know, pigeonholed into just a bruschetteria. Uh, we've actually been able to create and, and work with any concept of cuisine uh, just to demonstrate the uh, basically uh, the uh, versatility of what we have in our kitchen. So that was a great benefit for us. Um, but at the end of the day, there's the secrets of how to work in those environments. It's a tight work, uh, tight network. Um, imagine a kitchen line just being you know squeezed in where you really have room to pass beyond your neighbor or your coworker. Um, for us, it's a lot of communication. So we've adapted, I think like that's the strongest fundamental aspect of our business, whether it's guest related or uh, staff related, strong communication. Because you can only do so much movement back and forth. So we're constantly asking for, you know, passes, you know, a, a network of exchange favors, et cetera. So it's strong communication. So it's a different approach to working in the kitchen altogether. Uh, but for us to really kind of explore this organically and learn it the, as we go, we've kind of been able to adopt and change and, and really kind of author our destiny. I think uh, the, the possibilities are essentially endless. Uh, having the ability for me, this is obviously a first, having, you, or having the ability to relocate your kitchen essentially anywhere, to be able to operate a kitchen with appliance anywhere, really gives you endless possibilities of what you could do. Uh, whether you, you know, take that on site, wherever your property is, or you pursue off site uh, events, Really, there's uh, not a lot to kind of say that you can't do certain things. And that's the interesting thing for us is that when you're confined to four walls and a foundation, there's really uh, minimal growth or expansion 
even if you continue to expand the space and grow into a larger dining room or even a larger kitchen, it's not necessarily um, a lucrative or a sustainable model. For a food truck, it's just having the flexibility of just going mobile. And essentially, the way that your kitchen is structured or designed, or even if it's a kitchen that you inherited, you really look to say, what else can we do in addition to what we already have? Uh, whether it's a celebrated theme, uh, whether it's actually moving into uh, a, a neighboring concept to a restaurant or even a takeout, uh, there's an endless possibility. So for me, the future of food, tr food trucks, I feel like, is just now being explored. Previously, food trucks basically offered a very limited menu, uh, maybe not necessarily with the most expertise, uh, but now you have chefs similar to myself who are classically trained uh, and also might have had some experience working in fine dining or even uh, Michelin-starred restaurants who are truly excited to offer the cuisine that they know how to in a fine dining white tablecloth uh, restaurant but try to showcase that off of a mobile kitchen, which really for us has worked to our benefit. It's been a, a blessing and a curse. Uh, the blessing is that when somebody actually receives the food from off of our food truck, their expectation might be slightly lower because it's a food truck. And when those expectations are exceeded, uh, they start to look at, oh, wow, why, you know, if this is coming off of a food truck, then why else couldn't it come off of somebody else's food truck? So if anything, you're kind of continuing to up the ante or raise the bar. Um, and for me, that was the, the initial goal. I want to take what education, what knowledge I have, what techniques that I have developed over time and showcase that in a comfortable setting uh, off of a food truck. Let's go ahead and demystify what is potential uh, from, you know, what to expect from a food truck. And really, a lot of that has to do with the emphasis of just working off of our farm. So I don't suspect that we're the only ones pioneering this concept, nor will we be the only ones uh, that are in this. Uh, so I expect to see it duplicated in else, uh, you know, other places. Uh, I've always said that, uh, at least in the last couple of years, that Oregon is uh, continue, continuing to explore what those opportunities look like. They have an amazing agricultural program, some amazing produce um, and pioneers that are basically outward thinking are happening in Oregon, so that scene could take off at any given time. Um, to me, one of the things that I expect to see with the, the rise of food trucks is that the chefs are basically uh, becoming competitive to continuing to raise the quality of the food. That's something that is, there's endless possibilities to do.